Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for us to build the cheapest RTX 4060 gaming PC? Because that's exactly what we're going to do here today. We've gathered all of the parts for a gaming PC that give or take should cost around about £700. And this one was actually proudly sponsored by NVIDIA because if you do want to grab a rig very similar to this, then you can find one listed down below from AEWD IT that actually have an RTX 4060 pre-built gaming PC for UK pounds At the time of filming, of course. Throughout this video, we're going to go through all of the parts that we're using. We'll show you why they're in the rig, what they're great at, maybe some things that could be improved. We'll show you the full build process so you can see exactly how to put this thing together yourself. And then, of course, at the end of the video, we'll be walking you through the full gameplay benchmark numbers so you can see exactly how well this thing performs. And there is absolutely no doubt about it that the place I simply have to start today is not the motherboard, not the graphics card, but the case. Because this could possibly be the best named case I've ever come across, right? Not because the model name is the HC195, but because the brand is called Hell Crack. I mean, it's slightly confusing because it says on the box Hell Cracks and it says on the front HCS. So I'm not sure which one it is. But this is a very budget orientated chassis. To be fair, it's not actually screaming like ultra cheap, like some of the really cheap ones I've used. This one costs around about 40 pounds or so. It's kind of got like that fractal torrent-esque look going on the front of this. And it does actually come with three RGB fans as well. So in terms of value for money, this is definitely a way of saving yourself some money. These are a little bit tight, but that's okay. I can still do it by hand. I've been going down the gym. Haven't really. I know you guys have been commenting like, Oh, look at his muscles. That's all natural, mate. And I am pleased to say as well that this is a tempered glass panel. No acrylic. Again, you can save money if you want to go for something nearer 30 pounds and it won't be as good. But the main thing for me is just that it actually accommodates all of our hardware. It does have cooling that doesn't sound like a jet is going to take off and ultimately you can build inside this without running into any issues right yes there's no cable management grommets here i mean the fans are these like three pins because that's the other thing you have to watch out for i once bought a case that was around about 30 pounds or something here in the uk and that had like molex fans so you couldn't even control the fan speed they ran like quiet enough so it actually wasn't the problem i thought it was going to be but Yes, um, you do want to be able to control your fans. This is very cheap though. I mean, that is as thin as anything. Again, doesn't really matter if you're trying to save money, but something to be aware of. Yeah, cable management around the back is um, not going to be the easiest. You do have these little channels here, but there's really not much thickness available. So if you are going to be putting like extra RGB hubs or special fans or something in your rig, not really going to be the best option for you. But I was supposed to be checking out the fans, wasn't I? But the fans themselves, that just looks like RGB to me. Yeah, and then there's a SATA connection. So you're not gonna be able to control the fan speed of these, as far as I can tell. But as long as they work and they're not too loud, it's not the end of the world. If they're loud, forget it. But let's proceed to place our hell crack to one side for a second and actually press on to the meat and potatoes of any gaming PC, the graphics card. This one being the RTX 4060. The one we've got here is from Palette, but there are loads of different SKUs. To be honest with you, I'd probably just go for whatever was the cheapest one, as long as you check reviews and make sure that the noise levels and things aren't too high. But because these are really power efficient cards, I've not actually come across any 4060s, to be honest, that I don't like, but make of that what you will. Uh, the 4060 itself is one of my favorite cards, purely because the performance it offers is actually great for most gamers at 1080p and 1440p but it does give you access to those nvidia exclusive features so things like dlss super resolution which is my personal favorite you've got dlss frame generation and then you do also have rtx ray tracing with support for things like dls there's too many words there's too many words with support for things like RTX Ray Reconstruction. That was almost perfect. I don't have to write this stuff down. This is in my head. Anyway, we're gonna be using the RTX 4060. Genuinely, it is one of my favorite GPUs, very highly recommended. But in order to actually afford our RTX 4060 within this budget, we are gonna to have to cut a few corners. And we're gonna start by doing this with the motherboard. So this is actually a B550-A Pro motherboard, which means it's AM4, means we have to use the previous generation of Ryzen chips. It also supports PCI Gen 4, so if you do wanna go for 
like a higher end storage drive, especially if you're gonna be playing like future direct storage games, could make a significant difference. So definitely worth looking into this. But the chip that we're going to be using with this is the Ryzen 6 core 5500. And this is a little bit of a choice that you're gonna to have to make really uh, between Intel and AMD, because if you go for the Intel option, which would be the same sort of price, the 12100F, that will actually perform better in a fair few games, but it's only a four core chip, whereas this one is a six core. So it's gonna vary, I think, depending on the game that you're gonna play and what you use your PC for. But ultimately, I personally probably go for whatever's cheaper and then sort of upgrade it at a later date. Neither of these chips are necessarily ones you're gonna wanna keep for years and years. But obviously it depends on how much money you wanna throw at PC gaming. Do be aware, oh no we do, I was gonna say do be aware that most B550 boards don't actually have a 3.1 header for cases, but this one does, which is nice to see. The Hellcrack has two USB-A 2.0 and then one USB-A 3.0. So to be honest, actually for most people, just using like receivers and things, that's probably better than just having like two and a type C, but it depends again, what you're gonna use your PC for. Grab the IO shield from within, seal it back up again, pick up your motherboard once more, and then just gently lay this down on the box ready for construction. We can then crack open our CPU box. This one does come with a cooler as well. This is obviously gonna save us a whole bunch of money, but you just gently line this up, get the gold arrow to line up with this little like circular ball on this motherboard. So the Ryzen text is facing towards the IO on the back of your motherboard. Gently line it up till it kind of falls in place and then just lower this lever back down till it's safe and secure. Then you can proceed to take the cooler out of the box and this is a screw down one. So you will need to remove the default AM4 mounting hardware just by taking these four screws out with a standard Phillips crosshead screwdriver. Then you can pick up your cooler, gently line this up with those holes, then just screw it down in a cross pattern so you're not putting excess force on the socket. And if you sort of do one of the screws up all the way, then you almost certainly find that your cooler is sort of pinging off in one direction and then you can't actually screw it down anyway. Once you've done that, you just wanna grab this little fan cable and then find where it says CPU fan and just gently plop this over the top and this will regulate the speed of the fan so it's only spinning up when there's action going on and the rest of the time your PC will be a little bit quieter. Once you've got that screwed down, you will need to grab some memory or some RAM. This is a 16 gigabyte kit, it's running at 3600 megahertz. It's DDR4 and this is actually one that is optimized for Ryzen, but this is not particularly expensive. I think depending on where and when you get it, around about 35 to 40 pounds here in the UK and probably very similar in US money, but lovely editor Carl will leave all the pricing down below for us because he's a good egg. And to install this, very straightforward, just open up slots two and four. Don't put them directly next to each other unless you've got four dims because you'll be running in what we call single channel mode and you actually lose speed and thus performance. But you just line up the groove with the one that's on the motherboard and then give it a good push down and then do the same with the other dim. If you're not sure whether it's actually plugged in, by the way, just make sure these little notches are all lined up because quite often if it's not in properly, it will look like this and this could actually cause your whole PC not to boot, which would be very sad indeed. And then the last thing that we need to do before we can actually put this inside our chassis is of course to install some storage as this is what's gonna have our OS and actually have all of our lovely games. This one is from Silicon Power. I believe this was a Gen 4 drive actually, and it certainly offers very good value for money. But as I always say with storage, have a look at sales and make sure you're buying the one that offers the best sort of value for the speed at the time of checkout because it does vary quite a lot. But I imagine this Silicon Power one will just be cheap a lot of the time. But I'll leave links to everything, by the way, listed down below if you do want to build either this or something similar for yourself, your partner, your child, your gran. The actual installation process is ridiculously simple. Just take this little cover off the top. This is what we call the SSD heatsink. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you do use this top slot though, even if you have others on the motherboard like this one, because this is the one that gives you the full rated PCI Gen 4 speed. And if you don't use it and use a Gen 4 drive, then you are literally leaving performance on the table. Another thing to make sure you do, and I guarantee loads of people have not done this and are watching this going, oh, uh, it's to remove this little uh, like protective cover on the heat pad itself, because if you don't take that off, it won't be working properly, so your SSD will get hotter than it needs to be. Replace the screw, and then repeat with the other side. To actually get this installed, all we need to do is grab our case. We'll lay this down flat. Then, if you haven't already, do make sure you do have the IO shield out of your motherboard box. 
there's not always one of these to be fair you can tell because if you have like a plate on the end of this then it's already like pre-attached but if you're using a more budget friendly board like we are here today you'll get one of these old school plates that you need to push in at the back of your chassis. You then want to have a look at these things that we call standoffs and see if they're already installed and they've got six here but the ones that say A also need to be inserted. So they've provided these in the bag that comes with the case. They look a little bit like this and they're very easy to install. You just screw into the hole. And if you do have some pliers lying around, I would highly advise that you do tighten them up because what can happen is when you use your PC for years to come and then you want to upgrade the motherboard, you find that they can get stuck on the other side of the motherboard where they weren't actually inserted all of the way. But I mean, that is a future you problem, so it's not the end of the world. Once you have done that, it is literally then just a case of grabbing your motherboard, lining it up with that IO shield, and then just giving it a slight push down so that it kind of finds the standoff holes. Then you just need to grab your little ring screws that again come with the case and then just get this safe and secure. Once everything's safe and secure, you can then stand it back up and start to admire your work. And because this is, as I say, more of a budget friendly gaming PC, the good news is there's not actually much left to do. Like CPU coolers and things usually take ages, adding extra fans, uh, plugging things in, but there's not too much to do here. Obviously two components to go, but before you put those in, I'd always recommend plugging these cables in. But just get these ready by routing them through to the other side of your board, and then you can start plugging them in. So USB 3 is right down here at the bottom bottom look just like this directly next to that is your USB 2 the bottom right you'll find your power switch and then all the way to the bottom left you have your HD audio and at this point it's now time to actually get your graphics card installed so the best way of doing this is to watch this video first realize that you have these like bendy out PCIe finger cover things and you want to take these out before you put your motherboard in because you can risk damaging your motherboard if you take these out and they can like take things off your board. I seem to make this mistake every time because higher end cases have covers that are removable so you don't have to do this. Yeah, okay, it's okay on this motherboard because there aren't any clearance issues to be fair, but I would advise doing it before you actually put your board in. These things literally just kind of tear out and the best way of doing this is just to move it around a few times until it comes off naturally rather than yanking it. Then you can pick up your GeForce RTX 4060 graphics card. It's like the holy grail. It comes in an anti-static bag. This is always really noisy. And you then be greeted with your GPU. And obviously different manufacturer's designs will look slightly differently. Uh, I think there's an MSI one actually in the AWD PC, but as I say, this one's palette. I'd probably just go for the cheapest one, if I'm honest, unless you've got your eye on something specific or there's sales and things. But you just wanna line up this little groove here with the one that's on the motherboard then it should gently press down into position. And to get it safe and secure, you do need to use the hex screws that come with your case just to fit this down so it's kind of tied to the chassis. And as you can see, we really are now making fantastic progress. The last piece of the puzzle is the power supply. This one is also from MSI. It's one of the more entry level ones. It's not gonna be the most fantastic spec thing in the world, but it still is rated bronze for efficiency. So, you know, it's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg to actually run this thing. Uh, it's 650 watts as well. So it's got plenty of upgradability. So if you do wanna go for like a higher end GPU at a later date, then that should be okay. But it always depends on the exact specification of the cards that you're going for what CPU you're going to be using, all of these things. The only other real thing to note though is that this is what we call a non-modular power supply. So to save money, all of these cables are actually pre-routed into the power supply, which is great because it does save yourself well, some money, but obviously when it comes to cable management, it's not gonna look as pretty because all of these cables do need to be hidden somewhere in your chassis, whereas on like a higher end one, they would just live in this box and they wouldn't be inside your PC case. But if you're not that fast, it's not really the end of the world. You're just gonna have to make sure you find somewhere to store them. In order for this to actually fit inside our chassis though, make sure you grab the power supply with the fan facing downwards so it can actually breathe through its dedicated hole at the back. Yes, there we go, before securing into place with more hex screws. It's then just a case of untangling this mess. You'll find these things that we call SATA connections that are usually used for two and a half inch SSDs and larger hard drives, but can also be used for RGB hubs and things. And I believe that is what we have here for these RGB fans. So, as I say, tear through the mess 
and then just get the fans connected. Then you can stow all of the slack in that hard drive cage out of sight and out of mind. Grab the one that says CPU on the side of it and then feed this through this little hole at the top. This huge one that we call the ATX feeds in at the top left. And then finally, we have these ones that say PCIe that are used for our graphics card. These, depending on the case, can either feed sort of down, under, and up, or in this instance, we're just gonna go through the side here. Then we can give this a spin round. Trying not to drop it. And then we can start plugging everything in. So we'll start with our graphics card. It's just a single eight pin that connects in the middle of the GPU. Push it until it clicks. Then we can grab our ATX and plug this in at the top right of the board. Once again, fair bit of force till it clicks. Feed the slack through to the other side to keep it nice and neat. And then I think the very last thing we need to do is this eight pin at the top that we call CPU power. This just gently lines up. It is a little bit fiddly, but once it's in, it's in. And then that should be our gaming PC complete. We'll be testing it in just a second, but just to show you what the rear of the PC looks like, you can do a little bit of cable management just by sort of tucking cables into various different nooks and crannies. You can use cable ties that you do actually get in the bag as well. And you have these tie down points, but you've not got too much in here. So generally speaking, not too bad. I mean, the acid test is very much the side panel test. I've used the magic of editing to put just one cable tie down here. As long as this goes on, I'll be happy. So screw that in. And then that, I now think, is our completed gaming PC. But will it work? I really hope so. So we've grabbed ourselves a monitor, keyboard. I would say mouse, but we've dropped it on the floor. Mouse. Uh, but also the one and the only PC-centric mouse mat. If you want to grab one of these, check it out with the link down below. When they are gone, they are gone. And you'll be sad. But here's the moment of truth. Power switch, obviously make sure that's on. Graphics card actually gets plugged into the HDMI, not the motherboard. Power, and we have some RGB lighting, which is definitely nice to see from a case that costs around about 40 pounds. It's not too loud, actually. I mean, here's your initial noise test. That's obviously the minimum that you're gonna get, but I'm sure once we get gaming, the graphics card will obviously ramp up and make a little bit of noise. So we got lights, but are we actually gonna get a signal? It looks like it, it's doing something, yes! This is what you're after. Uh, it just basically says uh, you've installed a CPU and sometimes says like press F1 to continue, or like this, it's just loaded us straight into the BIOS. So the only thing really we need to do is go over where it says XMP profile. We hit this button and it's gonna change our RAM speed from the slower 2666 megahertz to the full rated speed of your kit. So we hit yes. It will then restart and assuming that it likes the memory, obviously, I guess technically the term is supports memory overclocking, but I mean, it's easier just to say, if it likes the memory, it will restart and we'll be pretty much ready to install Windows. And it looks like it, there you go. If you do wanna verify this for yourself, you can see the DDR is now set to 3600 megahertz. So all we need to do is grab the USB flash drive for Windows 11, and you can make one of these really easily. I've made a full video about it, tight round corner of your screen that will go through all of the details, how to install it. Long story short, you just follow the instructions of that tool, load it onto a USB drive, and then when you put this in the back of your PC, we hit the restart button, which is very rare these days. It should then load automatically into the Windows installer. We're looking for a little spinny logo. Yes, there we go. And there we are into Windows. So let me get this all set up, get some games installed, and then we can look at performance. And indeed, fast forward an hour, hour and a half, and here we are all set up and ready to go. And this is the first proper chance really that was so weird. The parcel tape's just fallen on the floor and it sounded like someone walked in here and there's no one else in the house. So that freaked me out. Anyway, what I was trying to say is that the rig itself, I think it's really visually striking. I think for the money, you're getting a lot. I don't think there's gonna be many people disappointed with the way this looks. It's simple, but pretty effective. You can also customize the RGB with this little switch on the top look. So if you do wanna go for like a static color or a different effect, whilst you can't like change it in software and sync it up to anything else, there are quite a lot of options. So actually I think most people uh, will like it. But I will say that it's definitely not loud, but I would say this is kind of like a medium quiet gaming PC 
but when it's just idling, not doing anything. So if you pretty much use your gaming PC for just gaming, you probably wouldn't really notice, but if you're someone that likes to really like sit in, I don't want to say silence, but you sit using your computer and you are sensitive to noise, then this is definitely going to be a fair bit louder than your standard gaming PC that you can tune the fans. But obviously, you just spend a little bit more on a case and you can get something with better quality fans that you can control or obviously swap these out for something else. Choice is entirely up to you, but let's press on now to the gaming. And actually the first thing I want to do that I would do anyway, even if this wasn't like an NVIDIA sponsored video, is to say I'm a big fan actually of the new NVIDIA beta app because it annoys me as someone that builds loads of different computers on the old version where you had to log in. They've got rid of that now and you have everything all in one place essentially. So the idea is to sort of get away from the NVIDIA control panel altogether. So you can customize loads of things in this new panel now. If you want to download things like FrameView, which is what we actually use to measure the like latency and uh, frame rate and stuff people are always asking, then you can actually just open that directly through the app now. It's not pre-installed, but uh, it's very easy to do so. Uh, you can update your drivers as well, similar to how GeForce Experience works. You can also go over to your graphics options. You can sort of customize them here in the same sort of way you would in the original NVIDIA control panel. And if you do also want to like auto optimize your game, so if you're not, it's not that you're not fussed about changing the settings, but if you just want to let NVIDIA take care of it and you'll get the best settings uh, that are going to be optimized for your personal rig, you can do that. You don't have to worry about it. But that's the new NVIDIA beta app. Let's jump into some Apex. And here we are on the ground, currently running at high settings, 1440p, and our frame rate's not bad, actually. We're getting around about 110 to 120 frames a second. The thing that you do want to pay very close attention to is going to be CPU bottlenecking, because I would, if you can, advise specking up the CPU a little bit higher, so maybe something like a 5600 or 5700, or of course, if you look at Intel, then you get maybe the 12400F, that's going to give you like a higher frame rate. And essentially this number at the top left hand corner of your screen where it says GPU usage, if that is around about 96, 97%, it means we're not getting any bottlenecking at all. If it drops a little bit below that, then we are kind of at the limits of the CPU. And I think that's where we are at the moment. But whether this really matters, I'm not 100% sure, because if you're trying to save as much money as possible and still get a really good gaming PC and one that you can upgrade a little bit later down the line, I mean, I think you're going to be happy with 120, 130 frames a second in Apex Legends. It's a six core CPU as well, so it can handle background tasks a whole lot better. And of course, don't forget, we are running this at 1440p. So this isn't even a 1080p machine. We're still running this at what I would describe as the sweet spot for PC gaming. We're going to see if we can improve things a little bit though by turning down the resolution to 1080p and then some of these settings here Anything really that reduces the CPU load, I'm going to reduce. Let's turn these down to low, low, medium, medium, medium. We hit apply. And then indeed our frame rate has now massively increased as we're currently setting around about 160 to 170 frames a second. And this is what PC gaming is all about. It gives you that flexibility to choose the settings that you want, get the refresh rate that you want, because ultimately if you're playing on like a budget 1080p monitor or something like that, or anything really that's running at 60 hertz, it's not really gonna make a massive difference. You want all the visual fidelity. But if you're going for like a 1080p 165 hertz monitor, then I'd say this is probably now the sweet spot really is you're actually able to see all of those frames, which obviously helps with responsiveness and ultimately can help you to be a better multiplayer player. And I also realized, by the way, we haven't done our peel yet. Now that was perfect. That was a 10 out of 10. But let's now move on to our second game, some Halo Infinite. And as we did with Apex Legends, we're first running this at 1440p at high settings, as we're physically jumping out the way, apparently. Uh, to avoid that. And the frame rate is pretty decent. I mean, it's not as good as you'll find on Apex as we're currently getting around about 60 to 80 FPS, but this is still more than enough really for you to play this game, enjoy it and be competitive. But I would probably advise turning the settings down ever so slightly, maybe to medium, just to get us near the 100 FPS mark if you're sort of wanting to play as competitively as possible. Moving across to 1080p resolution in a slightly bigger and more intense map, this is Big Team Battle, you can see that our frame rate has increased but it's not like a crazy difference as we're now getting around about 90 frames a second rather than the sort of 75, 80 we were getting before. This kind of solidifies what I was saying about it's like where and when you are in the game necessarily. Like you obviously always get highs and sometimes you get lows. But overall, it's definitely a very capable system and Halo is one of the more difficult multiplayer games to run if you're running at high. 
I mean, let's have a look what happens if we turn this down to medium, actually. If we want to maximize FPS, we go to medium. Has that made a drastic difference? I mean, it's definitely boosted it a little bit. Maybe we've got an extra five to 10 frames a second, peaking there about 107. So it definitely is worth having a play around to see what the right balance is for you. Everyone's tastes are going to be slightly differently. But if it was me personally, in a multiplayer game, I'd always be aiming for 100 frames a second. So I'd say 1080p medium is probably going to be your best bet. Moving across to game number three, though, it's the classic NVIDIA title. This is some Cyberpunk 2077. And what you're seeing here is pretty much going to be our baseline best case scenario, because this is running at high settings, so you could turn it down a little bit more if you want. Uh, but high, not ultra, with ray tracing disabled, DLSS super resolution set to balanced. And this is also using DLSS 3 frame generation. So like we said earlier, what happens is essentially the GPU renders one frame, then AI adds a frame in between, and then there's another rendered frame. So you get a lot extra smoothness, but it does have a slight latency penalty. And essentially my cheat sheet is if you can aim for 55 milliseconds or less, you're not really going to notice a difference whatsoever compared to having it off. If you're going to start to creep over 55, maybe 55 to 65, it's going to be noticeable, but like it doesn't matter massively. And then anything over that, you're going to start to really feel it. And I would say it's not really worth having on. But if you're ticking into, you know, like 60 milliseconds every now and then, something like that, that's going to be absolutely fine. But if you do want to have some rays traced, then you can, of course, go into the settings and find where it says ray tracing. And as you can see, the frame rate is still pretty much sky high, around about 115, 120 FPS. But going off my latency figures, you definitely can now notice that you're in the realms of, what's that, about 70 to 75 milliseconds. So you are not feeling quite as responsive as you were before. I mean, to be fair, this actually doesn't feel too bad. I'm surprised. I have a feeling, because I had like a dodgy recording a second ago, that the latency might actually be lower than it says. I'm not sure if there's something weird going on with the recording or whatever. Um, but this is definitely worth having a play around, experimenting with to get your sort of dream settings. I mean, just to show you what happens if we turn frame gen off, the latency will go down, but our frame rate will decrease. So what's that? We've now got around about... 65 to 70 frames a second, but then our latency is now about 55 milliseconds. So that's pretty much uh, the sweet spot if you don't want to use DLSS 3, to be honest, uh, but you still want the ray tracing, or I'd probably have ray tracing off and use DLSS uh, 3 frame gen if you want the highest frame rate possible. But the sweet spot is going to vary depending on how you want to play, essentially. But let's now move across to what has to be one of the most visually stunning games I think I've ever tested. And I've played this a little bit on the PlayStation, but this has just come to PC. This is Horizon Forbidden West. And as you can see, it is an absolutely jaw-dropping game. This looks absolutely incredible. And it's worth noting as well, this isn't even a ray trace title, right? So what you're seeing here is just impressive all round, even without having like any like fancy lighting effects and things going on. Uh, in terms of our frame rate, it is definitely the lowest that we've seen straight out the gate today. This is 1440p though, with DLSS uh, set to balance. So we're getting around about 50 frames a second or so, but I would probably advise turning this down a little bit. So let's see if we can go and change our preset to medium. I'll turn the filtering up though to four, but other than that, we keep it exactly how it is. And then yeah, sure enough, now we're getting around about 60 frames a second, and that's pretty much what you're after. If you can hit a minimum of 60 FPS, uh, you're gonna get a really nice, all round smooth gameplay experience. But this does actually have dynamic resolution scaling and things like that. So if you do wanna maintain a constant 60, it's not actually as difficult as you might think, as long as you've got the horsepower, like we do have here from our 4060. And it is also nice to see that it doesn't look like we're getting any CPU bottlenecking in this one, which is nice. And of course, as you'd expect, you can also turn this down to 1080p and we are yielding an even higher frame rate here. And yes, at 1080p, our frame rate increases to around about 75 frames a second or so. So yeah, if you want to play Horizon and you don't want to do it on the PlayStation, clearly this is a fantastic way to do it. And I'm now afraid that you're going to have to put up with me, future markers, because I realized there was a little bit of an error when we were doing our Horizon testing last time out. I'm not entirely sure what's caused it. I think it was the Activate Windows logo that was messing with things. But essentially our PC latency, as soon as I hit the record button, was going up by around about 20 milliseconds or so. So something in the pipeline was getting confused, was a little bit weird. We've fixed this now, so what you're seeing is full 1440p, DLSS set to balanced, medium quality settings now, but with a anastropic filtering at 4x rather than 2x, 
And as you can see, the frame rate is now absolutely spectacular. This is an awesome way to play the game. And you definitely don't have to sort of choose between like a lower frame rate, but higher visuals or higher frame rate and lower. This is a really nice way to sort of get the best of both worlds. I will say that the latency in places is still a little bit higher than I'd like, but if you're playing with a controller, I don't really think you'd notice this. And of course you can change the settings around a little bit more if you want to tighten things up even further. But I think most people are going to be really happy with this if you've got a 1440p display. Now, if you turn it down to 1080 with the same settings, so frame gen, DLSS balanced, then the frame rate goes up even further because even if you are getting a bottleneck with the CPU, DLSS 3 frame gen can actually help to sort of get around this issue because you are, of course, using AI to render frames in between those naturally rendered frames. And it works really well here. So again, loads of flexibility. Nice to have those NVIDIA specific settings because even if you don't want to use them, it's still nice that you have the option and you can, of course, only do that on the NVIDIA hardware. So then, ladies and gentlemen, there we are. The cheapest RTX 4060 gaming PC we've built on this channel. On the whole, not bad. I mean, it, it's tricky to say because if you went for the Core i3 or the Intel i5, then you would be getting a higher frame rate. So I think my advice would kind of lean you towards that way. But there are so many pros and cons of each because even if you went for the i3, that would then be limiting you to four cores. So while you might be getting some uh, better performance in some games, others might actually prefer to have six cores or maybe you want to do a little bit of multitasking and then having six cores is obviously better than four. It's tricky to say, but I think regardless of what way you go, obviously be aware that that CPU is not going to be perfect for everything and upgrading it later down the line, maybe not so much if you go for an i5, uh, is going to be necessary if you want to unleash the full power of this 4060. But if you're trying to save as much money as possible, on the whole, this is a cracking gaming PC. I don't think many people are going to be disappointed with it. But if you are going to specifically really be playing at 1080p, upgrading that CPU will give you better performance. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What do you make of our rig? Do you agree with me that actually probably going for Intel would make a little bit more sense? Or do you think that what we have here is the perfect package? I'd love to hear from you. So let us know down in the comment section below. Smash the like button if you've enjoyed this. Get yourself subscribed. And of course, as always, if you do want to check out current pricing on anything in this video, including everything that we've built here today, or the pre-built that you can get shipped to your door without you having to lift a screwdriver, you can find that listed down below with our affiliate links. But thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.